in the beginning there was God and uh, there was nothing else because God is the creator of all things. God was perfectly satisfied. He existed in three persons and these persons as one essence um, had perfect fellowship with one another. We don't know what that looked like. Is it possible that he created other worlds uh, and other um, beings before he created the Genesis 1 event? Uh, we don't know. He doesn't tell us anything. We know that he was there and we know that he he's unchanging so we know he was then as he is now great and good and and so on the purpose of creation is uh well there's probably a lot of purpose to it that god hasn't told us about we don't know everything we know what he's revealed we know that he is revealing his power in that he's creating things with words. Um, we know that he's demonstrating his orderliness. He creates containers first. He creates the heavens and he creates the earth. Um, early on he separates the waters so that we have dry land and sea. And then, over the next couple of days, he fills those containers with sea creatures and uh, fills the atmosphere with flying creatures, fills the land with land animals, and uh, he fills the heavens with astral bodies, stars and planets and uh, comets and, and whatever else is out there. Uh, he's proceeding in a very orderly way and he is making what he has designed. He envisions it first in his mind and then he makes it happen. Uh, initially just by speaking but, but also by using his hands. Um, we know that he used his hands, <laughs> I'm speaking metaphorically here, uh, to, to create man on the sixth day. But even before that, there are some interpreters who would say that um, um, he made the animals out of the land. That's the way they would read the Hebrew in that passage. So he's proceeding in a, in a very logical way and he is bringing into being uh, with infinite power what he has envisioned before it even existed. In that sense, uh, he's an artist. And I sometimes tell my students that the, the people who are most like God are the artists. And I, I make it clear that I'm kind of joking when I say that, but, but I think there's an element of truth there to envision and then to create. On day six, a lot of things change. First off, God verbalizes what he's going to do. It's almost as though he's planning it. Now, in what sense does an infinite, timeless God plan? In what sense does an omniscient God think? See, we don't know what we're talking about here. He is far greater than we can understand. But he describes himself as talking about what he's going to do. Let us make man in our own image. Um, I think when we take all of the scripture into account, it's reasonable to suggest that the us there is the three persons of the Godhead. We don't learn about them in great detail until the New Testament. Uh, others would say the heavenly council or something, um, but there, is, there appears to be a conversation or at least a communication. 
And then in, in those words, he says, the man that we make is going to be different from the other stuff we made. Uh, he is going to be in our image, in our likeness. Uh, and then, rather than s simply speak, he could have spoken man into existence. But rather than do that, uh, as I like to put it, he gets out of his chair and he is described in very physical terms as a sculptor who, with his hands, shapes the clay into the form of a human body. And at that point, it's a recumbent statue. It's not a corpse. It's just a, a, a form of clay. And then he breathes into this form, the breath of life. Now, not everybody would agree with me on this. But I wonder, I notice that very, f the physicality of that event. And I wonder if the Son, who one day will become incarnate and will be placed permanently into a human form, and who many think is the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, who appears in physical form. He sits in Abram's tent and has lunch with him, okay? Uh, and a lot of interpreters would say that's the Son, that's, Je that's the Christ, Jesus. I wonder if Genesis 1 is another Christophany where Jesus appears in human form and he, with his hands, he sculpts a body that looks like his so that we are patterned in his image rather than his body being patterned in our image. And then he, he gives it a rescue breath, just one. <laughs> he doesn't, he's not like an EMT who has to say, come on, buddy, breathe for me, breathe for me. Uh, he gives him a, a rescue breath and this form pinks up and be, becomes a living being. Um, I'm speculating a little there. But it seems to be consistent with the way the account is narrated there. Well, we know that God was seeking a relationship with his creature. He is in his image. Um, that man is designed to be in relationship with God. And we know that that relationship would have been perfect. We know that God gave him instructions about caring for the garden and uh, about what his food sources would be and so on. But we don't know nearly as much from that account as we wish we did. What did they talk about when they walked in the garden? How regular was that? Was that every day? It doesn't really say. Uh, did they joke? <laughs> Were they, were they friends? Was, was God manifesting himself in a human form? As I've just speculated. Uh, they walked in the shade in the garden. Did, did God point out things to him and say, you know, this one, this is really high in vitamin C. You ought to, you ought to eat a lot of that. Um, so much to wonder. But we know they had a relationship, and we know that it was good. Well, what breaks the relationship? To begin with, God does not need, he does not ever need to find out what will happen. He's not testing Eve to see if she'll eat the fruit. He knows what's going to happen. Now, does that mean he's responsible for the sin? Absolutely not. God is good. There are lots of speculations about why God would have provided an opportunity for Eve to choose badly. 
Um, I don't think any of the suggested explanations really do the subject justice. We're limited in what we're able to discuss. But some have suggested that uh, God wants a relationship with Adam and Eve. And that means they need to have the ability to love and to choose. If there's no choice, then is it really a relationship? Now, the thing I don't like about that explanation is that it implies that God was confined by a system that's greater than himself. If I want to get this result, I have to do this. And God is never under constraint like that. So I think it's a defective illustration or a dis defective theory. But it does make a lot of sense that you don't want your friends to be robots. You don't want to hypnotize people so that they'll like you. You want them to like you because they, they want to like you. And I think certainly there's an element of truth in that. Okay, Eve, the Bible tells us, was deceived. I think it's interesting. The snake talks to her and she doesn't seem to be surprised. And that suggests to me that this is happening pretty soon after creation. Eve doesn't seem to be aware that snakes aren't supposed to talk. <laughs> right? I mean, she's, she's not sure how this whole system works. And if you've ever traveled to a foreign country, you know what that's like. They have different customs and you don't know how things are done and you're kind of a victim here. Well, the snake talks to her and she talks back. Uh, does she know that he's bad? Well, does she know what bad is? Um, she's completely unfamiliar with how the world works. Um, so she talks to the snake and she has no reason to distrust him. He's not like, what was the name of the snake in the jungle book? Trust in me, right. Um, she, she, he says, oh no, you don't understand. Well, she knows there's all kinds of things she doesn't understand. So, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So you don't understand. Uh, God knows that if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll be as smart as he is, and he doesn't want that for you. And that, that makes sense to her. So she's deceived. She doesn't realize the significance of what she's doing. Now, Adam comes along, and uh, the Bible seems to indicate that he was not deceived. He remembered what God had said. You, you must not eat of this fruit, the fruit of this tree. And whether he heard the serpents talk to Eve, it, it's not clear. So he looks at the situation and says, this is not good. And then the New Testament makes it pretty clear that he thinks about that. He looks at the situation and he says, I'm with her. I'm with her. Uh, she is going a different way from what God told us. I'm going to. And he makes that decision. Whether he does that out of love for his wife, loyalty to his wife, as I've said, this whole thing is apparently pretty new to everybody. So how much, how much of a track record do they have together? Um, but he chooses. He knows that what he's doing is wrong. And he chooses to turn from what the Creator has told them. And that's the reason why, um, theologically, we don't blame Eve. We don't talk about the sin of Eve being passed on down. I mean, we blame her, she sinned, but uh, it's the sin of Adam 
that causes the fall of mankind, that, that infects us all with this sin tendency. Uh, he's the one who's responsible. God responds to that sin. And by the way, he cries, Adam, where art thou? Uh, he knows. He knows. And some have suggested he's saying that so Adam will think, what have I done? Where am I? I don't know that that's necessary. He could be simply um, giving Adam an opportunity to come forward and to confess. Uh, but he, Adam uh, explains that they've, they've eaten the fruit and uh, they're ashamed now. And God begins to issue curses. Now, it's important to remember right at the beginning that he knows it has always been part of his plan that he would be the one to take care of the curse and that he would do that by taking the curse himself. This has always been the plan. So this isn't a case of God getting ticked off and smacking a bunch of people around. That's not what's going on here at all. But God uh, speaks to Adam and he says, now you're going to have to work for your living. You're gonna, it's going to be hard work to get the, the garden to produce. Up to now, it's been easy. And now he says, the sweat of your brow. And all of us, uh, men and women alike, know uh, any girl who's grown up on a farm has had to work just as hard as her brothers. I guarantee you that. Um, and we all know that uh, work is hard now. He curses the woman and says she will have pain when she bears children. And that's interesting to me that the, the source of the greatest joy is uh, comes to be in pain now. I have two children and one grandchild, and I know that uh, childbirth is a painful experience. Yet there is this wondrous sense to it that as painful as it is, uh, there is this anticipation of great joy and, and fulfillment of that great joy uh, in the birth of a child. And I think God is teaching his people something in that, that out of great labor comes great joy, great fulfillment. And he turns to the serpent. Now, I spoke earlier about the possibility of God being in human form, in physical form, during this, these early chapters of Genesis. Is it possible that the God, the Elohim, who is speaking to Adam and Eve there in the garden, who has walked with them in the garden, is the sun. And now the sun is having words with the serpent who is indwelt with uh, the evil one himself. And the sun is saying, the day is going to come when the seed of the woman, and he knows he's talking about himself, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. Uh, and this is, this is two mortal enemies facing off, making an appointment for a battle that will take thousands of years to take place, but will result in the utter defeat of this evil presence who fought that he was destroying God's creation. And in fact, all he's doing is destroying himself. It's a, it's a powerful story. Why does God expel them? Why, why all this drama? Well, uh, that's kind of a two-part question. The basic answer to why all this drama is that God is just. 
And you don't want an all-powerful God who is not just. That isn't something, that isn't a universe you want to live in. He is just. And yes, that often means that he needs to confront sin and danger to the community when it arrives. Um, if, if a judge in our country says to a murderer, we'll tell you what, if you promise to be good from here on out, we're going to let this slide. The family members of the victim are going to be furious and justly so. Evil calls for justice and, and you can't just let things slide. Now there is a place for grace and grace is written all over this story uh, by the end of it. But here right at the beginning, God makes it very clear that this is not something to be messed with. Um, that the, the, frankly, the consequences of our rebellion against God are much more hurtful to us than the punishment. Uh, so what he's doing is teaching them. He's saying, now look, this is what happens when you, when you don't do what I tell you. And it's not, again, it's not a case of God getting ticked off and smacking people around. It is God teaching, like teaching the child, don't run out in the street. There are consequences out there. Uh, so that's the, that's the big part of the answer. God is just, and that's a good thing, even when it hurts. He gives a second reason for the expulsion from the garden. He says, I don't want you to eat now from the tree of life. And we don't know what all that meant. But it appears that uh, they could have been confirmed in their fallen state eternally if they had eaten the fruit of the tree of life after having eaten the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And how much of that is symbolism? Was it literal fruit on the tree of life? Uh, I guess so, I don't know. Um, we're in way over our heads here. But he is protecting them by uh, removing them from the possibility of being permanently cursed. He loves them and he's going to do the right thing for them. Well, as time goes on, uh, humans multiply and God uh, determines, and again, I don't want to make it sound like he decides, uh, uh, but God's plan includes that he will select from the mass of humanity a biological people, um, particularly to represent him in the earth and to experience his blessings in an unusual way and to be the means of transferring those blessings, uh, uh, multiplying those blessings uh, to the rest of the world. And he chooses Abraham, Abram he's originally called. Uh, and he promises him, uh, you're going to have a whole bunch of descendants. There's your biological people. And I'm going to give them a land. So they're going to have a geographic location, an identity as a nation. And in you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And he's promising a coming deliverer. And what Abram can't possibly know is that that deliverer is, as I suggested, the very one who was talking to the snake in the garden. Um, God himself is going to become a, a biological descendant of a human uh, take on human flesh, and permanently, he's going to remain a human forever. Talk about a commitment. <laughs> so when, when God first makes man, he is committing to be united to him forever. It's just an astonishing story. 
And so God makes Abram that promise. And it takes a long time for that to happen, 2,000 years before Messiah, the, the one in whom all the world will be blessed, will come. And there are a lot of pitfalls along the way, a lot of f failures as well as successes. And through it all, God is shepherding his people and tending them uh, to the end of uh, being a bl bringing blessing to all the nations of the earth. God is, by blessing all the nations of the earth, God is doing more than just rescuing them. Uh, he accomplishes that uh, through the cross work of the Son at His first coming. But once the payment for sin has been made and the whole garden fiasco has been resolved, there's still an eternity uh, for God's people to serve Him in uh, in infinite ways and good and successful ways once they've been delivered from their sinfulness. Well, God has become a human in Christ. He has paid the price for their sin. He has uh, solved the sin problem. But who's going to be in charge of all these people for the rest of eternity? Well, as a man, Christ is appointed king. Uh, that, that kingship is not obvious at his first coming. The closest he gets is a crown of thorns. Um, but, and a little sign that says king of the Jews hanging over his dying body. That sign, of course, was intended as an insult. Here, Jews, here's your king. Stinking Jews is what Pilate is thinking. Well, uh, he will come again. And he will be an obvious king at that coming. And he will take dominion over all the world. I believe for a literal thousand year kingdom, the millennium, but then for all eternity and uh, going far beyond the new earth. Uh, and that comes because of God's agreement with David. Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, had told his son Judah, the king's going to come from you. And David is descended from Judah. And Jesus is descended from David. It's interesting that in that Davidic covenant, God says, I've chosen your son who will rule in your place. And it's pretty clear that at first he's talking about Solomon. But Solomon turns out to be a real disappointment in a lot of ways. By the end of his life, it appears that he's worshiping idols uh, with his foreign wives. But by the end of, of God's conversation with David, it's pretty clear he's not talking about Solomon anymore. He says, this king is going to reign forever. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. And there is somebody coming, uh, that is Christ, the Son, who is not going to be the disappointment that David's chosen son, Solomon, was. So that, I think, is the, the major significance of the Davidic covenant, the eternal king. It's absolutely significant that when we turn the page from the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, to the New, it is introduced with the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew is saying, now Matthew's uh, Jewish. His name is Hebrew. Um, and he's saying, remember that promise to Abraham? In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Remember that promise to David? Not only is there a, a resolution of the Eden problem, but there is an eternal king. 
and Matthew highlights both of those facts in the first sentence. And by starting with the genealogy, he says, see, this is the genealogical line within the biological nation that God set up. I would suggest that the very fact that he includes that genealogy means that the Jews were keeping track. That was on record. He could look it up and, and write it in his, in his gospel. Uh, they understood the promise and they were watching and waiting. Well, keep in mind you got several groups of people here. Uh, a lot of people are illiterate and scrolls are expensive. Nobody's got a Bible at home. Nobody. Uh, the scrolls are kept in arcs, uh, containers in the synagogues. And there was only a handful of people who had the privilege of touching those things. Um, but the leaders, the leaders had to know. As I've said, I think uh, they were tracking the kingly line from David through Solomon. And I think there were people in charge who knew who Joseph was. He was the rightful heir to the throne. They knew that. And his son would be the heir. Um, now, in the, at this time, the high priesthood of the Sanhedrin, the, the rulers, was highly corrupt. It was all about making money and holding power and using the money you were making to buy power. The high priesthood was auctioned off every year to whoever wanted to pay for it. It was a horrible system. Okay, these guys know. They know. They had to know. But they will not allow their power to be overthrown. And uh, so they're going to kill this guy. And I really believe that at least some of them knew who he was. And they killed him anyway. Now, that tells us a little something. All these years after Eden, people are still inclined to do the wrong thing. They're looking out for number one. They're doing what I want, what's good for me, money, power, or whatever. Um, and we're tempted to let the common people off because they didn't have the Bible and only what they heard at synagogue. Um, but there were plenty of them who thought that Jesus was crazy, you know, and, and laughed and mocked. Um, it is human nature to resist the good and to choose the evil. And Jesus knows that. And he dies for them anyway. It's a remarkable story. Yeah. I would suggest that if those who killed the Messiah had repented, they could be redeemed. We have this scene at the cross. He's being crucified. He was condemned by evil men who were I think knowingly resisting the plan of God. He's being mocked by the bystanders. There's a sign, King of the Jews. Yet it is very clear in the gospel accounts that Jesus is not a victim. He says, no one takes my life from me. I give it up on my own. On the cross, he says, it's finished. And then he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he, the Greek actually says, he delivers over his spirit. The King James says he gave up the ghost. He delivers over his spirit. He decided when he was going to die. And the great irony of this scene is you've got all these opponents 
screaming and mocking and you've got this person who is nailed to the cross and he's in charge of the whole operation. This thing is happening exactly as he has planned. Okay. Uh, the height of irony, he's not a victim. He was giving his life as a sacrifice. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's an order that's by appointment only, <laughs> okay? And God appointed the son, the father appointed the son, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And as a priest, he is not only offering the sacrifice, he is being the sacrifice and accomplishing the solution of the Eden problem uh, on his own terms and at his own pace. God, God has chosen to take some time now that the sin problem has been solved, to take some time to develop his people in various ways through suffering and, and through accomplishment and so on, uh, for an eternal life with him. And during this time, he's given his people a commission, which is go and tell the story. Now remember, he had always planned that every nation would be part of his kingdom. And ironically, as Adam and Eve ran from God to hide because of their sin, God's people now are sent out from God as his servants and to take the message to the ends of the earth and physically to extend the, the gospel story to every nation on the planet. And Jesus said before he left, when that word goes out to the whole planet, then I'm coming back. That's the sign of his coming. Uh, no one knows the day or the hour, but uh, it looks to me like we still got some work to do. There are places in the world that are still pretty ignorant of the gospel. Uh, but when God's people sent out by him take the story to the ends of the earth, and the last repentance takes place. God knows who will repent and who won't. And I don't think he's gonna wait a minute longer than the last repentance. And then the end comes and we move from a time-bound, space-bound universe to an eternal state where his uh, revelation says his servants shall serve him uh, and will do so without all of the nonsense that comes with being sinners and weak and distracted and selfish and all of that nonsense. Uh, I don't think we'll be sitting on clouds playing harps. We'll be accomplishing wonderful things and always uh, successfully, always without setbacks and, and uh, cost overruns and schedule overruns and all those sorts of things. It's, it's a remarkable plan and it is certain.